Welcome back to Beyond the Patterns. So today I have the great pleasure to welcome back one of our former graduates of the lab, Professor Matthias Unberat. So he is now an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at Johns Hopkins University with affiliations to the Laboratory for Computational Sensing and Robotics and the Malone Center for Engineering and Healthcare. He has created and is leading the Advanced Robotics and Computationally Augmented Environments Lab, Arcade, that conducts research at the intersection of computer vision, machine learning, augmented reality, robotics, and medical imaging to develop collaborative systems that assist clinical professionals across the healthcare spectrum. Previously, Matthias was an assistant research professor in computer science and postdoctoral fellow in the Laboratory for Computational Sensing and Robotics at Hopkins and completed his PhD in computer science at the Friedrich Alexander University Erlangen Nuremberg in Germany, from which he graduated summa cum laude in 2017. While completing a bachelor's in physics and a master's in optical technologies at FAU, Matthias studied at the University of Eastern Finland as an Erasmus scholar in 2011 and joined Stanford University as a DAAD fellow throughout 2014. Matthias has published more than 80 journal and conference articles and has received numerous awards, grants and fellowships, including the NIH NIBIB R21 Trailblazer Award. It's a great pleasure to have him back here at our university and today he will be presenting Bridging Domains in Medical Imaging, Differentiable Mappings Between Two and Three Dimensional Data Domains. Matthias, it's a great pleasure to have you back and the stage is yours. Thank you, Andreas, for the kind introduction and more importantly for uh, the wonderful invitation. It's always a pleasure to be uh, back in Erlangen this year, unfortunately, virtually. Uh, I would have loved to, to visit you in person and appreciate the Christmas spirit that is, uh, it, it, it just feels so much more like Christmas if you're in Germany, not, not in Baltimore. Although they try to emulate it here in the Inner Harbor as well with a Christmas market. It just doesn't feel the same. So I've decided today to talk about um, some of our recent work that is plays a role in between um, 2D and 3D data domains, because we all know that medical imaging data lives in between these domains. We have 2D data, we have 3D data, and connecting these domains seems to play an important role. And I will give you a better introduction to that topic in in a little bit. It's very, it, it's a pleasure for me to see some of the familiar faces uh, back from the time when I was with uh, the LMA in Erlangen. Um, and for everyone else, I'm Matthias, I graduated from the same lab in 2017, and you have a great advisor in Andreas. Um, I'm sure you'll be very successful uh, in the future. So um, before starting the actual uh, content of my talk, I want to mention that this is the work of many people. Um, we have collaborators. Um, well, within my group, of course, we have collaborators uh, with the, in, within the Department of Computer Science, uh, but more importantly, also with um, hospitals, um, with the Johns Hopkins Hospital, that is um, that is a leader in in many regards, where we get to talk and you know inform our method development by the problems that they encounter in their everyday practice, um, and working together with them on the problems is great because it allows us to shape a way forward together so that the solutions that we develop neatly fit into their uh, surgical workflows. And then there are some collaborations, of course, also with uh, this group, in fact. So thank you for that. It's always been great. All right. So bridging domains in medical imaging. Why, why do we need this? So I think you probably all know that medical imaging is an enabling technology. Uh, and when I say enabling technology, then I mean that quite broadly. 
uh, because what we're seeing now is that with the medical uh, model, medical imaging modalities that are deployed all across the the hospital, <clears throat> we are now able to perform non-invasive diagnosis, uh, which allows us to investigate per certain disease patterns without having to biopsy, for example. And it allows us to perform procedural planning and map out the steps that will need to be performed intraoperatively. And then we have other modalities that are deployed intraoperatively, which allow us to rethink surgery and develop less invasive surgical approaches that are now guided by uh, imaging technology. And this is really the focus of today's talk, uh, which is image guided interventions. Now, while these approaches now are less invasive, they're minimally invasive percutaneous, if you will, they are much more complicated for the operators themselves. And the reason for that is that rather than having full exposure of the surgical scene, the progress of the operation now must be, um, must be derived from two-dimensional images onto a three-dimensional scene that suffer from projective transformation. And this is problematic because these images have a very limited field of view. They are two-dimensional versus the scene that is three-dimensional, which means that overall the operator lacks context where the images, uh, where the images <clears throat> and the observations in that image are located with respect to the overall 3D scene and interpreting progress, interpreting the tool to tissue um, and anatomy relationship is very difficult to do in such scenarios. So consequently, there is a lot of work going on that tries to connect the 2D images with the three-dimensional scene in order to simplify these uh, minimally invasive approaches and provide navigation and guidance to operators in these scenes. Now, a lot of that, those approaches are in the context of surgical navigation, where we put markers all across the scene and use optical tracking systems that allow us to register all these components. The problem with those systems is that while they accomplish this task quite efficiently, they also come with increased workflow, increased um, calibration times at the end. And overall, they are not particularly compliant to the current surgical workflow, which inhibits their adoption. So really what we would like to do is we would like to use strong novel computer vision paradigms and machine learning techniques in order to develop systems that allow us to improve context, improve the understanding of the, of the scene in this talk via means of 2D and 3D alignment and uh, alignment of these spaces to guide navigation and improve and, you know, uh, improve the assessment um, of these images in surgical tasks. The first example that I will give on the work that we've done in this regard is, um, is what we call projective spatial transformers. And I will talk on how these apply to uh, 2D and 3D registration in the X-ray guided uh, intervention setting. When we talk about image-based 2D, 3D registration, then really what we would like to accomplish is we would like to recover the six degree of freedom pose of a pre-operative three-dimensional scan. Most of the time, this is a CT scan uh, with respect to the intraoperative two-dimensional X-ray image that is acquired using a C-arm system. Uh, why do we want to do this? Well, usually the reason why we want to do this is because we have performed pre-operative planning um, on based on the three, uh, three dimensional CT scan. And now closing this loop, aligning the 3D scan with a two dimensional intraoperative X-ray image allows us to propagate forward the surgical plan from the 3D to the 2D X-ray image so that we can provide guidance on the images as they are actually acquired during the surgery. Now, this turns out to be a reasonably complicated task. And the way how, how this is usually addressed is by formulating an optimization problem where we try to optimize over these six degree of freedom post parameters based on an image similarity, right? So we have a three-dimensional representation. We know how that three-dimensional representation maps to two-dimensional representation. We call that digitally reconstructing radiographs, DRR generation can be done by ray casting. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then we compare these two images, the one that we have actually acquired with the one that we have digitally rendered from the 3D scan, compare the image similarity and based on image similarity, update our post parameters. And you can see on the slide at the bottom, uh, you, you can see how such, an, um, such a process iteratively updates the post parameters to essentially uh, align the two spaces. 
right? So this is a visualization where we know both the, uh, both the 3D spaces in both domains. Now, it turns out that doing this in this iterative scheme by optimizing image similarity is, is a complicated problem. And the problems arise from, from multiple domains. So in conventional image-based registration, which is the, the scheme that I have just um, uh, talked about, is that we optimize for a handcrafted uh, optimization objective. And this handcrafted optimization objective was image similarity. Now, image similarity is not necessarily what you want because images, particularly in um, X-ray guided surgery where we, have, um, where we have transmission imaging, images can look quite, uh, quite different even if the viewpoint only changes a little bit. So this means that if we use image similarity to compute our overall optimization objective, we will, we will end up with a highly non-convex cost landscape. For example, the one that you see here on the left-hand side for a diminished coordinate system problem where we really cannot find, where we cannot easily find the global optimum that we try to recover in this optimization problem. So this is the first issue. The second issue is that and this is somehow derivative from the first one is the fact that if we have something that is highly non-convex, initialization is, very, is, is a very important topic. And properly initializing these registration techniques is not necessarily easy. Most of the time it requires manual interaction in order to find the proper initialization range. So usually we define this, uh, uh, this term here, the capture range, as the range in which 95% of the registrations will converge to the true solution. So this means that if we initialize somewhere outside of this range and we use some a technique that is gradient-based and doesn't have sufficiently large capture range to overcome uh, local minima, for example, we will not converge to the true solution. So consequently, we will find the wrong answer a lot of the time. So in, in cases where we have uh, optimization loss landscape that looks similar to this, we really need to make sure that we initialize properly. And if we do that, again, we need manual interaction. Now, one way to overcome this issue is to use more advanced optimization techniques. For example, uh, CMAES, that increase the overall um, uh, capture range of our optimization problem, but it's still relatively narrow compared to the overall six, de six degree of freedom space that you could potentially initialize your problem in. So overall, what we're finding is that two, uh, conventional image-based 2D3D registration is very, very heavily dependent on proper initialization. One way of overcoming this challenge um, has been to learn the registration problem, right? Rather than doing image-based uh, image based registration like we discussed before, maybe we can simply regress the pose of 2D images directly from the images as we observe them. A challenge that we're observing there is that while multiple different approaches exist, um, there are some that do direct pose regression from a two-dimensional image versus, uh, with, with respect to a canonical um, 3D coordinate system. There are other approaches that use anatomical landmarks to regress the pose. Most of these approaches are limited in the sense that they only process the two-dimensional image, which means that in a way they are agnostic to the actual 2D, 3D registration problem where we try to align a 3D space to a 2D space, right? These approaches usually only process the 2D image that is observed during surgery, and they somewhat forget about the 3D space, replacing it with something that is a canonical atlas. That's a bit of a shortcoming there. Okay, so what should we do about this? Well, so, so here's a dream. Uh, this is what we would like to have. What we would like to have ideally, right, is maybe a convex loss landscape. If we were able to get a convex loss landscape for this iterative optimization problem that we talked about in conventional 2D, 3D registration, then already the naive approach that we talked about earlier, iteratively updating the post parameters based on some similarity function that now is convex, then our approach would in fact process both two-dimensional and three-dimensional uh, three images at the same time. Because now our loss landscape is convex, our solution would always be robust with respect to initialization because you're guaranteed to find the, local opt the global optimum. And because you have this nice property of convexity, you would very well, even a gradient-based method, something as simple as stochastic or, gra or, or regular gradient descent, would very quickly converge to the optimal solution that we would like to find. Okay. But we just said that image similarity doesn't give us such a cost function. 
So how do we convexify the loss landscape that we get from traditional image, uh, from, from traditional image-based registration? So here's a rough idea. And this idea is that we do not know how, how to design this convex image similarity metric, right? Normalized cross-correlation, similar structural similarity, and so on, they don't give us a, something that is robust with respect to different post views. They don't give us a convex image similarity metric. But in recent years, we've seen this rise of universal function approximators. And if we are able to define in some space, potentially say in post space, something that is a geodesic, something that is convex with respect to what we care about, maybe we can use that to and um, as, as a learning target and approximate this convex similarity function between images using that other uh, signal source. And this is what we're going to be talking about now. The problem with this, however, is that you can see already that in this specific problem set that we're describing, we have a three-dimensional representation that is then mapped onto a two-dimensional X-ray image. And this is then compared to the actually acquired two-dimensional X-ray image. So we're going to be, we need to be connecting the three-dimensional space to two-dimensional spaces, ideally in a differentiable fashion, so that we can train function approximators for this, for this type of problem. And I will now talk about how we're going to do this. So, what I just mentioned is that in order to train a network that differentiably connects 3D and 2D spaces, we need a differentiable projection and unprojection operator. And um, we called this, we decided to look at this problem in the context of spatial transformation, spatial transformer networks. Uh, you can here see my ties to Germany. Uh, we called this the projective spatial transformer, uh, which abbreviates to POST, which uh, again, hints, hints at my ties. To, to Germany. And the, the reason why we want to look at this this way is because we will need to have gradients, not only with respect to the three-dimensional input volume, but also with respect to the post parameters theta. So what, what happens here is that we will define using the K matrix, which is the in, intrinsic matrix of your camera, in this case, the, the CRM X-ray system, we will define this canonical projection grid Right, because K essentially gives us the principal ray. It gives us where, where our pixels are in 3D space. And from there, we can define um, this, this canonical grid now that, that lives in projective space, right? So you can see that this is not a Euclidean space, it's a projective space because it has a convergence point. And on these, we, we do it such that, um, that the indices IJ go in detector space and then the, the, last, uh, the last index K essentially uh, goes along these rays. Um, and I will tell you why this is important in just one second. And this now is this canonical space that essentially um, samples the frustum of our C arm space. Now, what is going to happen is that based on this spatial transformer language, we are able to move the sampling grid in, in 3D space. And the moving and transforming the sampling grid in 3D space happens by a, a parameter theta that uh, is essentially six degree of freedom, three translation, three rotations. And that used with this transformation right here gives us a transformation that is within SE3. And that moves the sampling grid in, in 3D space so that we can sample with our canonical grid different spaces in or different regions in our three dimensional space. Now, this again gives us a three-dimensional representation, right? This is a three-dimensional grid. It samples 3D space. So how, how does this relate to 2D imaging? Well, it turns out that what we do in X-ray imaging is we integrate along lines. So this is the only thing that's missing from this three-dimensional sampling of this canonical projection grid to a two-dimensional X-ray image is the integration along all of these detector lines that we have here in our canonical grid. And because by construction, by the fact that all the samples along a line are one last, uh, are just the last dimension of our grid, we can essentially compute a sum along the Z or K dimension in our grid. And that gives us an, approxima uh, an approximation of the integration along those rays, right? So this is essentially a way of using a discretized, uh, this is essentially a discretized ray casting operation that we have designed here. But because it is designed this specific way, uh, we immediately get 
gradients with respect to um, with respect to our input volume and with respect to the post parameters uh, theta. So this is quite appealing. Okay, so now let's check whether our idea worked. So this is now nothing, nothing fancy quite yet. This again is just regular um, image. Uh, this is just image based 2D, 3D registration. You have a three dimensional volume. The three dimensional volume is forward projected now not using ray casting as you would do generally, but it's forward projected using our pros, this uh, projective spatial transformer module I just talked about um, on the previous slide. This gives us a two-dimensional um, X-ray image, and that two-dimensional X-ray image is then compared to the actually acquired X-ray image. It's also 2D using a traditional um, image similarity function. In this case, it's gradient uh, normalized cross-correlation. Okay. Then what happens is that, as I just mentioned, right, this is differentiable. This module that we have here is now differentiable with respect to our input volume, but more importantly, it's fully differentiable with respect to our post parameters theta. So what this means is that this gives us analytic gradients with respect to theta, which allows us to drive updates in theta and run this iteratively, okay? And this is what you see here. So as we, as, as we generate new images, you can see that here in this uh, false RGB composite color overlay, we generate images. These images are not perfectly aligned. We compute the gradient of our similarity metric that is also differentiable with respect to our post parameters. We back prop on the, on the computational graph into theta and we go that update step with a small step size and we iterate that, right? So nothing, nothing fancy here. This is just traditional image, uh, this is just traditional image based 2D 3D registration. Um, but now based on um, deep learning language in the sense that we use backpropagation and computational graphs to drive the optimization. Nothing learned in here just yet. Okay, uh, by the way, uh, this is the, the, the code is available um, on, online on GitHub um, if, if you feel like uh, using this. It's fully integrated in PyTorch and can be used as a package there. Okay, so now taking this one step back, we now have this, this nice differentiable um, mapping there that, that maps three-dimensional representations onto two-dimensional representations um, differentiably um, with respect to both the pose and the input volume. So now let, let's consider this in the context on, of convexifying the loss landscape between these two images. The idea behind this is again, that we are not able to, to, um, to identify a convex similarity metric between images. But the nice thing is that we don't necessarily have to. What we have to do is we have to approximate something that gives us gradients with respect to theta that are in the desi desirable direction. And because during a training phase, we know precisely what theta is going to be, we can learn representations here in 3D and in 2D such that gradient updates with respect to our theta parameter are going to be in the desirable direction, irrespective of where we are in our six degree of freedom optimization space. And we'll walk through that, that idea in a little bit greater detail in the next couple of slides. So this sounds like a very complicated mapping, but the good thing is that this is now fully differentiable, which means that it nicely fits into the language of deep learning. So we can go in and rather than not using any learnable components at all, as we did just previously, we can simply introduce different components that are now optimizable, deep convolutional neural networks that give us representations that make it easier for our network to do exactly what we want it, which is close to convex gradient updates with respect to theta. All right. So again, Right. This is now filling, a, a filling in a couple of dots. So we have a three-dimensional convolutional neural network here that processes our 3D input volume that we want to align with our intraoperatively acquired um, X-ray image. This right here is a, is a residual network that com computes a higher, higher dimensional representation of our input volume. Then this is fed using some pose parameters, relative pose of the 2D X-ray image into our projective uh, transformer, resulting in an X-ray image that is encoded to a latent representation. And the latent representation of that image is then compared using a simple mean squared error, right? So this is just L2 between this representation and, and the representation that we get using the same network um, applied 
to our fixed image that we have acquired using our uh, using our real image, right? So for now, this is just a conventional 2D, 3D uh, image uh, registration pipeline with learnable representations. So during training, our target pose is known. So we know what the pose of our target image is. And it turns out that if we know that, then we can actually compute these optimal directions where our, in so our initialization, well, let me start like that. So we have, our, we have our current pose parameter for this image, which is theta right here. We have our target pose theta f. And the question is, how can we go from this theta to the de desired theta where we want to be going, right? So this is what we try to accomplish. And if we know both of these, we can use the Riemannian manifold to compute the geodesic that connects exactly these two things. And it turns out that because this is a geodesic, it has all the nice properties that we were looking for. So computing exactly that update will give us the desirable connection between these two poses. Very nice. So this is going to be our supervisory signal. The only question now comes that if our true gradient, if the true desirable objective that we want to be optimizing here for is a gradient step in, of theta in the desired direction, then this is a bit of a complicated optimization objective for a neural network. So how are we going to accomplish this? Well, we're going to do this using a double backward pass. Okay, double backward, how are we going to do that? Well, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take our extra image that we have acquired. We're going to take our three-dimensional representation and we're going to pass this through our, up, uh, through our network with respect to this loss that we have here, right? We compare the two representations that we have, our digitally reconstructed image right here and our target image. This gives us this mean squared loss function here at the end of our network. Then what we do is we do a second backward pass. And the second backward pass is now, uh, and, and essentially what we do with this one, so this is, uh, this is just the first forward pass. Now we get to evaluate this mean squared error loss here, right? So now we have taken everything through our representation. We compute the mean squared error. We compute the first backward pass. What the first backward pass now does is it takes this representation and back propagates it everywhere. It also back propagates it into this theta right here. So this now tells us that given our current features that we have learned, the three-dimensional CNN, the encoder network and 2D that we have here, this is, the gradient up, this is the gradient step that we would take for theta if we were to apply this network to drive optimization at this specific time point. But now this is where we want our loss to actually live. This loss we don't care about. What we care about is that the gradient update of theta is in the right direction. So now what we do is we compare this to the desired theta update that we have from the geodesic on the Romanian manifold that would take our update in the direction of theta f. That gives us a second loss function. And now we back propagate with respect to all parameters through the network again, but now from this one as our, uh, as our loss head. All right, this is the second gradient pass that is then used to update the parameters. Okay. This allows us to essentially update our parameters. And once we're done by updating our parameters and really uh, have converged in, in our optimization, we're back at this conventional view on 2D, 3D image registration pipeline, now with learned representations, where during application, the only thing that happens is that now the, C, the, the three dimensional and the two dimensional uh, deep convolutional neural networks are fixed. We're not going to update them any longer. We're just going to take our three-dimensional volume. We start at some initialization parameter theta that gives us a two-dimensional image that is encoded. Same thing with the fixed representation also encoded. We get the two, uh, the two representations that we're going to be comparing using a mean squared error loss. We compute the gradient with respect to this mean squared error here. We back propagate that through our network into our post parameter and take an update step. And that is then run iteratively in a conventional 2D, 3D image registration sense. And it turns out that if you do this, um, it works surprisingly well. So we can overcome very, very uh, uh, deep local minima using this simply because we're not driving our, our updates based on conventional image similarity. We're driving our updates based on this learned image similarity that essentially emulates properties of the Romanian manifold of the geodesic that we have there, right? So you can see that 
right here over the registration, this is the uh, grad, uh, well, N NCC normalized cross-correlation image similarity metric. You can see that we're, we're moving in and out of, of pretty, pretty substantial local minima, but we're not stopping there because we're not using this to drive our gradient updates. We're using our, our network similarity function, the one that we approximated using the technique I just discussed um, to overcome local minima and converge into in, 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 the, in the correct global, global minimum that we're interested in finding. Now, one thing I should probably mention is the fact that if we only use this image similar the, the similarity that we that we just discussed um, we're not going to get the, the the proper solution and the reason for that is that we're actually using something that is a very high level concept so it is it has a very wide capture range as you just saw we're able to in initialize our um, we're, we're, we're able to converge the true solution from very far away, but simply because we're learning such a complicated mapping we're not particularly precise when we get close to our true solution. Conversely, image similarity is actually quite precise, but it has this very narrow capture range. So really what we're doing is we combine the two and say that once the updates that are driven by our learned image similarity metric fail to make further progress and we're, have, we're iterating over a fixed point, at that point, we will, we will switch the weights and we will use a conventional image similarity metric to backpropagate into our post parameters to... Um, to refine our current pose estimate. And it turns out that, that this combined approach works quite well um, to give us very, very good uh, registration performance um, in, in these cases. However, uh, we have some issues with generalization. So this is, this is of course, because we need the true pose parameters. This is trained on, on synthetic data. So when we apply this to real data, um, it, it still works in a way. Uh, you, you, can, you can see those numbers down here. So this is what you get um, if you're in, in domain based on the pure synthetic data that, that we used to, uh, to train. Um, but then if, if you're transferring this to real x-rays, you see quite a substantial drop in performance. And uh, we're working on, on resolving that using, using generalization techniques. So where do we go from here? Well, next steps probably uh, we'll consider multi-object 2D3 registration with occlusions. Right now we haven't considered any implants, any metal, any K-wires or screws. Um, and we're, we're interested in applying this type of technology to other, to other applications, for example, single view, uh, single view 3D reconstruction, where we have to solve a reconstruction and post, uh, post estimation problem concurrently. Um, or if, if we're interested in, in trying to think about this for other reconstruction tasks that are multi-view, uh, we also need to think a little bit about, about higher resolution uh, mapping of this, simply because the, the canonical grid right now has a pretty high memory footprint. Um, and there are other techniques like the ones that, that were developed also here in this lab where you can do um, differentiable ray casting. And that has a couple of other challenges uh, because you would need to consider gradient checkpointing, particularly if you're interested in the, in the gradients with respect to the post parameter. So we're, we're thinking about how, how, to, how to achieve higher resolution if we're moving forward. And then finally, we have, we have quite a bit of work going on in, in uh, generalizability for x-ray procedures, particularly because it's very difficult to to create and acquire data in a certain way in X-ray uh, that is not currently being used in clinical practice. So um, it, it's really that this sim to real transfer is something that is of particularly high importance in X-ray guided procedures, simply because we can't change the current treatment paradigms. So that is something that we're very actively working on. Okay. So this is the first uh, application that I wanted to talk about. And I will spend the next couple of minutes talking about something that is uh, related in the way that it also differentiably connects 2D and three-dimensional domains, but it's in a completely different um, example. And here we're going to talk about quantitative imaging um, via 3D reconstruction in the context of um, endoscopic procedures. So we have a pretty strong collaboration for quite some time with the Department of uh, Auto uh, um, Otolaryngology at, at Hopkins, uh, where we work with Masaru Ishii, who is uh, working on sinus endosco um, end endoscopy guided uh, sinus procedures. And really what happens there is that the preoperative planning and the monitoring of topical treatment effects, for example, steroid injections in, um, in nasal polyps, all happens by interpre interpreting 
um, sinus endoscopy videos, like the ones that you see here on the bottom right hand side. And these videos are in 2D, obviously. They, they suffer from projective transformation of the three dimensional anatomy. And all the interpretation that is being done, both longitudinally as well as cross sectionally, is pretty qualitative, simply because these video sequences are very difficult to align in, the, in any meaningful way. And this is really where, where there is a lot of potential for, for uh, AI based vision algorithms because they can potentially allow us to reconstruct these videos the idea or essentially reconstruct the three-dimensional anatomy from these videos that are acquired routinely in clinical practice which once we have three-dimensional representations would enable quantitative assessment um, and because it's all based on on routine endoscopic video there is no change in workflow it's simply added benefit without any change to workflow which is very very appealing okay so how are we going to achieve three-dimensional reconstruction from routine endoscopy video? The general idea that we have here is that this is, uh, this is monocular vision, right? So we can't use stereo, stereo vision, we can't use uh, other such approaches. So the first thing that we would need is we need to somehow estimate depth from our video sequence. And the easiest way to do that is to estimate depth from, from every frame uh, using a deep convolutional network. So that's what we're going to be doing first. And then we don't only have one frame, uh, we have a whole video sequence. Um, so to have a proper understanding of the overall anatomy, we're going to merge information over multiple, uh, over multiple images over the whole sequence and aggregate that in a three-dimensional fashion um, to get a full reconstruction. So this is the general idea of, of what we're trying to accomplish here. So the first step that we need to do is we need to do something like what you see here on the slide, which is monocular depth estimation. So one endoscopic image in processed by some algorithm, it turns out it's going to be a fully convolutional neural network and a depth map out. The challenge here being that convolutional neural networks are trained via backpropagation. Backpropagation requires us uh, to specify a loss function with respect to we can take derivatives. And if we need to define a loss function, we need to know what, how we're going to construct that objective. So if we don't have uh, proper, proper depth knowledge, then we can't really specify a highly informative loss function for supervised learning. Right? It really just means that if we want to solve this optimization problem, we need to come up with a strong surrogate signal to drive optimization of our post parameters. How do we supervise learning essentially? We don't have dedicated hardware. We can't do this supervisedly. So what we try to do is we try to look at conventional structure for motion or conventional computer vision algorithms that process video sequences to somehow extract information that is that pertains to 3D. And the first algorithm that comes to mind in that regard is the structure for motion algorithm that became quite popular uh, around 2010, 2011, where, we had, where, where there was this paper reconstructing Roman or, or building Rome in a day, uh, where they mined images on Flickr from, from popular sites in Rome and then uh, reconstructed that using a powerful structure for motion algorithm um, to reconstruct Rome. So this estimates, these algorithms, the SFM structure for motion algorithm estimates two things. It estimates a, par, a sparse 3D point cloud based on feature correspondence matchings, and it simultaneously estimates the relative camera pose. So the question that we really have is does, does an algorithm like this work on endoscopic data? Because if it would, then we would be able to get sparse three-dimensional data to supervise our training. And at the same time, we would get the relative camera pose, which is going to be helpful if we need to aggregate our information over, um, over time in one joint 3D coordinate system. So it turns out that this algorithm does work. It doesn't work particularly well because in endoscopy, we have a couple of challenges. The first one being the lack of photometric constancy because the light source moves with the camera. So you get all sorts of effects um, due to that, which means that overall, the tracking distance of features is not very long. And on top of that, you also have very scarce features simply because the overall um, surface in the, in the sinus is not particularly feature rich. But we, we do get some corresponding matches and that allows us to solve uh, the structure for motion problem. And as a consequence, we do get three-dimensional points, sparse, but some, and a corresponding camera sequence. Okay. So now we want to think about how we can use this sparse information um, for supervising our training. 
The first thing that we will need to do from our initial idea of estimating depth from a single view is we need to make this a Siamese architecture because the way how we're going to supervise this is using the relative information between the frames that is, that, that is retrieved by a structure for motion algorithm. So we're going to process multiple images um, in this case, two at a time. And we're going to run the same algorithm on both of these in Siamese fashion using weight sharing. At the same time, we are also going to run a structure for motion algorithm on these images, which provides us with a sparse three-dimensional point cloud reconstruction and the uh, relative camera, uh, camera motion between one frame and the other. Okay. So now we need to use this information that we have to derive meaningful loss functions to drive learning. And we're going to derive two different loss functions. The first one that we're going to be using is something that, that will penalize the two-dimensional optical flow. So essentially we know the relative camera motion, we know a 3D scene. So using that information, we can compute the two-dimensional optical flow field of these points in both image frames. And based on our estimation that we have here from our three-dimensional from our three-dimensional monocular estimate, we can also compute a three-dimensional flow field using the relative camera motion. And then what we can do is we compare the estimated mo uh, the estimated uh, two-dimensional um, uh, flow field using our current estimate of monocular depth with the one that we actually get from our structure for motion algorithm. The reason why we do this rather than immediately comparing the dense 3D depth with the estimated 3D depth is because all of this problem, it's, it's monocular, which means that it's inherently scale ambiguous. So comparing this in 3D space is not going to give us a meaningful signal simply because our estimate of monocular depth is always up to scale. And consequently, we may get large errors, even though the overall trend is well preserved. The second thing that we now need to do is that we want to derive another gradient signal simply because the one that we just that we just defined based on the sparse optical flow is going to help us ultimately to be give precise estimates based on exactly these points. However, the signal that we get for optimization is very sparse. So we're going to derive another signal that gives us a richer signal. And that one is based on consistency. The idea being that if I run a Siamese network on one frame and on the other, and I know how these frames relate to one another in 3D space, I can take my two estimates and warp them in the, in the corresponding uh, other frame and compare whether the two um, estimated and warped version of the same depth, whether they agree, whether they are consistent with one another. And this consistency loss that simply compares whether these two independent monocular depth estimates make sense when warped into the other viewpoint now is a very rich loss function because it has a dense information and it drives optimization, particularly early on in the optimization problem. Now, this allows us to train a state-of-the-art convolutional neural network that performs monocular depth estimation right here on, on endoscopic uh, uh, images. And do, during the application phase, all of this very complicated computational graph that we have up here simply breaks down to something that, that just takes an, uh, a monocular image, runs, a, uh, runs inference of a deep convolutional neural network and gives us the, uh, the depth map estimate. The last thing that is missing is that we wanted to have dense reconstruction of the whole video sequence. And the way how we're going to accomplish this now is by using the relative camera motion that we also get from our structure for motion algorithm and aggregate this information using truncated sign distance function based representation in 3D space. And this will give us uh, an aggregate of all the monocular depth estimates along a sequence which uh, provides three-dimensional reconstruction. Again, as I mentioned before, all our code is available on GitHub and you can find uh, the implementations of all the algorithms I talked about um, here. So how well does this work? So these are some qualitative visualizations of, of how well these reconstructions look when we apply them on, on clinical sinus endoscopic video. So on the top, you can see a, a top-down view onto three representative reconstructions that we get from three different patients mm -hmm. from a perspective that has never been seen using the endoscope. 
Um, and here on, on the bottom, what you can see is two representative videos. On the very on, on the left hand side, you see the endoscopic video sequence that that is used to reconstruct the three D model, like the ones up here. And on on here in the second column, you see a fly through video through the same reconstruction rendered from the same position, camera position, uh, like like the one of the true endoscopic uh, video sequence. So qualitatively, these look very good. And when used for uh, 2D, for 3D, 3D re registration to a, to a CT scan of the same person, we observe submillimeter uh, residual errors. So this seems to be in very good agreement with what you get from, uh, uh, with the anatomy that you would uh, observe in a CT scan. Now, as a quick aside, maybe, is that uh, in, in the beginning, I said that we're going to use structure for motion algorithm based on SIFT features and SIFT feature tracking. It turns out that that, that is not actually a great idea uh, if you can avoid it. And the, uh, and the reason why that, that that's not such a great idea is because SIFT overall gives you very, very few matches. And the tracking distance is very short. So if you really wanted to aggregate information over the whole video sequence, SIFT would not allow you to do this simply because it wouldn't be able to track features all across the video sequence. So you cannot aggregate, right? Your, your camera sequence breaks down. Um, rather what we've been using is we've been using uh, this SIFT algorithm to train a much better feature detector and feature descriptor in a similar self-supervised way where we now use, again, a Siamese network that encodes the, the image content and image appearance at some point. And then what we use is we use the location of these SIFT matches in these two images to, to drive optimization here. And what happens is that we're going to sample this feature representation at the, at the point of a SIFT descriptor. We're going to take the feature representation there, and then we run that feature representation as a correlation kernel on the filter at the representation of the other image. And because we know where the SIFT feature had the corresponding point, we can essentially penalize this location using, again, a self-supervised learning loss. And this gives us now something that learns representations that are particularly good for matching in this scenario. And it turns out that these representations are extremely dense compared to the SIFT feature uh, descriptors extremely dense, I say. Uh, how, how dense does that mean? Well, considering this example that, that I show you here on the left-hand side is that we have 407, uh, 474 SIFT feature points for this video sequence. Um, 104 out of 381 frames are being tracked. So now if we use the, the, this new learned descriptor, well, this is what you get. You get uh, more than 25,000 feature points only selecting the best matches and you get the whole sequence um, as, as a tracked sequence, which really allows us to aggregate the information over multiple frames. And again, right, learned only in, in self-supervised manner. Okay. So this is the, this is the end of, of the talk uh, that, that I had prepared for, for you today, where I was talking about bridging domains and differ differentiable mappings um, between between 2D and, and 3D domains in medical imaging. And I think what we're really seeing is that there is this, this uh, shift from medical grade cameras that take great images with, with high image quality and, uh, and high signal to noise to, to task specific intelligence systems that are optimized for specific clinical workflows that, that try to increase the value of the data that is acquired in that specific workflow by means of smart processing, which really allows us to promote reliable and reproducible assessment. Finally, you know, these systems will, will grow to more actively support clinical decision-making. And because all of these systems are designed together with clinicians, they are, they are developed with clinical workflow in mind so that we hope that they, are, that they neatly blend and integrate well with current clinical workflows to uh, exhibit widespread adoption. So with this, I would like to end my talk. Thank you very much for your attention and I am open for questions. Yeah, I have some applause for you. Thank you. So thank you very much for this presentation and really very enjoying, enjoyed your presentation. Really very interesting approaches that you have been developing over the past few years. That's really cool stuff. 
So congratulations. Also, you also published this on really uh, big venues. So really, really good work. I enjoyed Thank the you. presentation. So I, I have a couple of, uh, so there are a couple of questions actually here in, in the chat. And one of the questions is you, you have this, this grid spacing that you're working with and you're, you're pre-computing this grid, I presume? Yes, so the, the, the canonical that, grid. That the camera parameters can't change because you would have to recompute the grid. So if the, let's say the source detector distance changes, uh, how, how would that affect your optimization? So at the moment, um, at the moment, the grid is canonical in the sense that we, we don't back propagate in any of those parameters. And I would need to think about whether it is possible to relax that assumption. Um, I, I agree that that would be great. Um, it, it would be great. I, I think that the source, the source detector distance is not the one that I would be too worried about. I would be Im more immediately worried about the principal point because mm -hmm. of uh, just wobble and and uh, and gravity, but we haven't thought about that. We haven't thought about that. Mm -hmm. I, I think the reason why the, the, the way how we take care about this, I think that is is just a contemporary view onto this problem, where where really we're trying to solve the initialization problem more than the rest, because. Um, image-based registration is pretty well understood if you are close enough to where you need to go. Uh, it's just the problem when, you, when you're far away that that's usually when, when things don't work. Yeah, and to be honest, they, they may change, but I think the bulk problem is of course in FIDA. So this is really what you're interested in and these are the main parameters. If you have the others fairly close, I think that already does a pretty good job. But still, it would it's, be interesting to also update those. No, I agree, and I mean, like, the, I think it also depends on the type of imaging system that you're looking at, right? If you if if you have a if you have something like a twin robotic system, maybe it becomes much more important to to be flexible with respect to this canonical grid. Whereas if you have a whereas if you have the rigid gantry of a of a C arm, you're probably okay with this approach. The, the the hopefully rigid gantry of a C arm. <laughs> well, exactly right. I mean, we know that it's not, but. At least in first it's, order, but, but it's more or less rigid. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, then also, the you are actually instantiating this this camera grid, and the, you already mentioned that it is presumably faster to directly do the ray casting. But then, the would the spatial transformer then work in the same way? Um, so the, the the problem is, I think we we've thought a little bit about this um, compared to the ray casting version. Is that I think the the one of the challenges is that if you if you want to be able to back propagate into into theta, you you need to know where you sampled where you sampled your volume, and this becomes problematic in the ray casting approach because you need to remember where you sampled. Mm. And, 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 and that's why this spatial transformer is advantageous in that regard, because you instantiate that grid. So you know, you, you know the values, right? You know where, where you evaluate it. And during the ray casting, you're building essentially exact gr this grid, right? You, you are, exactly. So what you, you could do this if, if, the, if, if the ray casting operator is modified such that you can use, say, what is becoming more popular anyway, with, which is gradient checkpointing. Um, yeah. you, you can essentially do this prob probably also using the raycasting operation. Okay. Yeah, in the in the raycaster, you like to use the textures because they are incredibly fast. But this yeah. is probably exactly information that you need for for yeah. the backdrop, right? Yeah, exactly. So that's why we didn't build on top of the differentiable projection work that that you and your group did, uh, but but ended up looking into the spatial transformation um, way of of formulating this because it it, it overcomes this challenge, mm -hmm. with a, so simply by the nature of having this canonical grid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it's it's good to think about these these things because. It, it, eventually it would make sense to bring those approaches together and maybe a, a hybrid approach or something like that where we try to implement this efficiently could help. 
But yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, there is there is interesting work coming out just on the weekend, actually. I, I found a paper that is presented at NeurIPS this year, uh, which is, uh, do you know NERF? It's the n- yeah. Neural, uh, yeah, neural yeah. Radiance Fields. Yeah. So there, there is a new paper that, that do, does exactly this based on um, neural radiance fields. So inverse, in, inverse pose estimation on natural scenes based on NERF representation. So th- this is... This is receiving um, more more attention now, um, but I think that overall the computer vision community seems to be less interested in volumetric representations of scenes simply because they don't necessarily scale as well as we would like them to. Absolutely. Yeah. Where, whereas in medicine, right, you, you you care about it simply because the your your volumes are are represented that way. Yeah, but they also are KD approaches and stuff like that that. Pro- potential would help and yeah exactly so yeah yeah no, i i agree and we've we started to look a little bit in that um in, in that direction um on more effective more effectively storing and more effectively sampling the 3d grid uh using using our structure or whichever other structure but we, we haven't really made much progress there yet yeah so midst of january we will have matthias niesner um from tu munich here and he will present some of his work and i mm-hmm. think there will be also some stuff about nerf in his presentation nice. so yeah it's interesting like, the, the, there there is a whole lot of things going on around nerf these days yeah absolutely so yeah very important things to keep in mind um yeah so one one thing uh, you're using this this two-way gradient pass and I've been wondering about your update procedure because it reminds me a lot on variational networks because they but what you do there is you essentially unroll the gradient procedure because your fitting is essentially a gradient procedure where you can unroll the steps and then you essentially end up with a, a long network of shared weights where each is a gradient iteration has the same number of weights. And I was wondering, to some extent, your procedure is very similar, but quicker because you don't have to store the entire unrolled gradient. But then you're essentially shortcutting, right? So you, when you do the update, you're computing the current feeder and the ideal feeder, right? Mm-hmm. So you, you don't have the entire history of gradient updates. No, we don't, we don't have the entire history. It's yeah. really just at, at that single position, we're trying to find the the update that is optimal with respect to the current direction, with respect to the current geodesic that 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 uh, connects the current position with the target data. So we, and that is we, based on the GeomStats package. So they have uh, they have implementations for geodesics on SE3, which is yeah. which is very neat. We've been using that for other other work as well. Yeah, I remember that uh, Sha and and. Um... Roman, they have been working on, on similar problems. And then mm-hmm. sometimes they tend to, to overfit because then they, so the, the first step of the gradient works really well, but then the subsequent ones don't work that well anymore because you try to solve the entire puzzle in a single step. And then if you model the, the gradient descent procedure with that, then you tend to get more, more robust training. But, so, but uh, yeah, 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 I don't no, think that I, this I is agree. a general observation or something. No, I, I agree. I mean, of, of course, it would be interesting that, but I think that this is exactly the, so, so this is why I think um, we, we definitely wanted to model this with a 3D scan in the loop um, rather than doing this purely based on 2D. We have another approach where we use the same geodesic, but what we try, so, I mean, the idea here is that we, we want to use the properties of the geodesic on in post space, right in Roman, on the Riemannian manifold in SE3, hmm. to hmm. To, appro- to approximate the properties of that based on image similarity, right? So the image similarity should have the same properties hmm. at, as as the thetas that that generate these images. So that's the, hmm. that's the underlying idea, and we have another paper in the Mikai workshop um, that that we tried to publish for quite some time, never really succeeded until then. That um, only consider this problem in 2D space. So essentially you have one 2D image and the other 2D image, you know the relative poses and now you try to do this mapping of the, the, the similarity function explicitly. So you really try to emulate, you really try to approximate the uh, geodesics on SE3 
there. And it turns out that there, exactly the problem that you mentioned in uh, exhibit uh, shows up as well, right? Mm -hmm. That if you if you do this, the first step was okay. After that, you're you're probably diverging. And you're not you're not getting any 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 closer. Okay. With this one, that the approach that I showed here, it doesn't it doesn't occur as much because we're taking very small steps. So yeah, it's, it's a little better behaved, at least from um, empirically. Do you think stuff like experience replay could also be used to tackle these kind of problems? I I, I guess so. And and just the history in general, I think, would make sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is which is not something that we have done simply because the networks are pretty big uh, already. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's freely. <laughs> it's generally the problem when you work with freely stuff, right? Um, Very true. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that would be interesting to look into. By the way, we will post um, all of the references that you just mentioned of your papers, of course, with the description of this video, such that people can look up the papers because oh, yeah, sure. it, I, it I, I, might be a bit a little quick that we are now jumping from, from one paper to another. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, I can, uh, if, if, if you want, I can obviously also share the slides with you. Yeah, um, that that would also be nice, and we will we will put the links all with the description of the video, and um, that's that's very useful. So there's there's one more question here. Other than many people are writing that this was a great talk, but um, we already mentioned that. No, it really was a really great talk. And there's one more question here uh, from the clinical application perspective. Would it be interesting to register the real endo endoscopy with the virtual endoscopy, assuming that you have CT scans? Um, yes. So, I mean, there, there are two applications here and I presented the one that is self-contained with only using the video because it, it from, 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 I think, um, an educational standpoint, it's easier to, to not bring in the CT. But, but ultimately, the reason why we do this is, first, longitudinal monitoring, right? So if I, if I apply topical treatment, treatment and I get uh, one 3D reconstruction at time point T, and I get another one at T plus one, I want to be able to register these two dense reconstructions, and I want to see whether, whether the polyp in that, in that case um, shrank or, or grew, right? These are the, the things that you want quantitatively. That's the one application. The other application, of course, is that if I have a preoperative CT scan and I go in during uh, functional endoscopic sinus surgery and I, I observe my anatomy, then ultimately, I, I, if I can close the loop to the CT space, I can essentially do exactly that. I can do a, a purely image-based navigation system. And uh, we've been we've been working on 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 that. Essentially, let me pull something up here because I think that it's probably interesting uh, to you as well. Is that so? There, interestingly, we observe the exact same problem that uh, you have that that I have talked about here all the time, which is initialization, right? So, uh, how how do you know um, where where you are? And what, what we're doing here, and I probably need to go in, in here small enough so that I'm not giving away too much. Um, so we, we've been trying to solve this, this type of problem um, again as a, as a registration now in 3D space. And to solve that specific problem, we're thinking about, um, again, correspondences between the, the different models. So what would happen is that you would get, so this is, the, this is a sinus, as you would extract it from a CT, from a CT scan. Um, you essentially have the nostrils here, then it goes all the way here to, towards the frontal sinuses up, up there, and then it goes down your, the, to the throat. And this is essentially the full CT model, the, the full model that you can get from a CT scan. This is the model that you get using the algorithm um, that, that I showed where you just have one quick scope in, into the nose towards the throat and back. And now you want to register this to, to, to that guy. And this is complicated. And what we've been developing here is uh, code is not, not there yet, but it will become uh, uh, publicly available soon, is a method that learns, again, descriptors, completely self-supervisedly dense descriptors in 3D space 
from uh, across these models so that you encode local, geomet local geometric properties of these 3D objects, irrespective of their overall scale and irrespective of the sampling, uh, the edge length of your mesh. Mm -hmm. so that you can identify corresponding points or corresponding regions across meshes of the same thing, even if you have partial observation like the one that you can see here. So you can already see that by, by learning these representations on, on these surfaces, you can probably see that using that, aligning these becomes a re relatively easy problem because you can rely on the, the, the surface representation um, to, to align these surfaces. And that then solves uh, this registration problem uh, which allows us to close the loop to the preoperative CT and then mm. navigate with respect to preoperative CT. Um, all of this is, so it's nice. Uh, uh, all of this has nice properties, right? You, you solve a hard problem, but because it's very complicated neural networks, it's not very real time. So this is something that, that we're working on right now to cut, cut down on the overall uh, floating point operations that you have and memory footprint of these networks to bring that closer to an actual application, uh, something that is uh, amenable to to uh, application time frame. Absolutely, and I guess you can then also learn which parts of the mesh are typically not visible in the endoscopic view, because then I mean you have a different modality, right? And they have a different mm -hmm. access to the anatomy. Yeah. So really cool work, Matthias. It was a real pleasure to have you at least virtually back here. I hope that we will soon also see you in person again when you happen to be here in the region. And um, I'm really glad about your presentation. Really cool stuff that you've been doing. And it was really nice to catch up. So thank you very much for coming here for the presentation. Thank you for having me. all the great work. Thank you for having me. It was a, it was a great pleasure. Some more applause. As you have seen, we had plenty of points to discuss today. And you see that, of course, the persons who attended the talk live could already ask their questions. But of course, that doesn't mean that it's already over yet. So I invite you to post your questions here as comments under this video, and I will forward them to Matthias, as well as I will post the references to the papers that we mentioned also here in the description of this video. So. Join us, join the discussion, engage in our research, interact with us, and you will see that you will find it very easy to get in contact with us. So if you enjoyed this presentation, I recommend that you subscribe us and follow us in social media. I'll also put the links in the description. And I'm looking forward to welcoming you again to another episode of Beyond the Patterns. Thank you very much for watching and bye bye.